This call to worship was written by Amanda Rogo. Most people say, most people say they don't believe me when I mention that Southern Indiana's natural landscape and weather is my favorite of any other place I have lived. They usually say this after I tell them I grew up as a Navy brat, mostly in Southern California and Hawaii, but it's true. Go with me here. Until I moved to the Midwest almost a decade ago, I never lived anywhere that had seasons. Sure, it does get a bit colder in the winter months in the places I have lived. And I think I put on a sweater a handful of times in Hawaii, but there are no true seasons like I get to see here every year. I still find myself giddy as a schoolgirl, okay, enthralled as each new season begins. I especially love the story of rhythm and rebirth. And the trees tell me every year, change, adapt, let go, rest, reemerge, blossom, help others with your shade and your oxygen and your sturdy trunk and branches that bend but do not break as the wind flows through. All the while being grounded, rooted to the things that matter most and standing tall, knowing that when it all happens again, it is as it should be. Our focus today is on the UU's final source, spiritual teaching of earth-centered traditions. I am far from an expert on this subject, but I do know that I agree with the words of progressive Christian, Cherokee author, activist, and farmer, Randy Woolley, who says, spending time in nature with whatever great mystery is behind creation softens one's mind. The great mystery unscrews the tight lids of the jars of certainty that you hold too tightly. You realize, sometimes even trembling, that something greater than yourself is meeting you. Come, let us worship right. together. Helena, do you want to open our wonder? Helena, do you want to open our wonder box for us this time? You got to do it last time, not that long ago. We got to open it here. There you go. What's inside? Can you pick it out and hold them up? Do you know what those are? All different types of seeds, and they all look really, really different. Yeah, we've got black-eyed Susans and false blue indigo. Go ahead and sit down. And milkweed, which looks kind of feathery. And we've got uh, bee balm. And when I think about earth-centered, I definitely think about seeds. And I wonder if any of you might have heard this story, which is called the everything seed. Have you ever watched a seed grow? I bet a lot of us have. Oh, we've had some seeds growing right out there from when we planted a little while ago, maybe in April. Have you ever noticed how it begins so small, so still, and so quiet, like a gift wanting to be opened? I like that idea. And how slowly it wakes up and begins to unfold, growing into something larger and larger and larger. Yeah, like a tree. And then, you know, whatever comes from a seed usually ends up looking very little like what that seed looked like from which they came. Well, this is also true of the very first seed. Once long, long ago. Oh, you know, it's going to be a good story when it starts that way. Way back before the beginning, so long ago, there was no such thing as time because there was no one there to count it. Everywhere was a huge, deep, mysterious place, like something waiting to happen. There were no stars, no sun or moon. There was no place like earth, not a drop of water or a single tree or a rock or a flower. 
and no living beings anywhere. Can you imagine that? (laughs) It would be different for sure. But in that deep waiting space was hidden the tiniest, tiniest point of something no bigger than a seed. It was not a flower seed. It was not an oak tree seed. It was not a seed of corn, although all of those things were included in that teeny tiny seed. You might call it an everything seed because that is what it became. No one knows where the first seed came from or how it was planted or how it knew in that way that only seeds seem to know how long to wait till just the right moment to sprout and grow. But all at once, this tiny seed cradled and nourished in the rich soil of space, woke up, mm, stretch out, make yourself nice and tall, broke open and began to unfold. And now you're gonna wanna start to watch my screen a little bit unfolding, unfolding, and blossoming forth into an enormous blazing ball of bright lights, like a great grandmother sun. Yeah. Oh, and the universe was born out fluttered of the galaxies like a storm of snowflakes swirling. Can you make snowflakes swirl? Yeah. (laughs) And gathered into the brightest, most blindingly beautiful clouds of stars. And out of those stars whirled our own star, the one we call the, the sun. That's right. And our earth and our moon, and all the round spinning planets we have learned how to name. And this is the secret of the tiny seed. You and I were there in the very beginning, just as the idea for each leaf on a big oak tree lies hidden inside an acorn. We were there with all the stars and planets, all the rocks and oceans, plants and animals and people. Everything that is now, ever was, or ever will be, was inside that first tiny seed. Can you imagine it all fitting inside that teeny tiny seed? Look at that. Wow. So whenever you hold a seed in your hand and wonder what it could become, imagine how you and all that there is once came from the tiniest speck of an everything seed before it sprouted and grew long, long ago, way back in the beginning of time. Now, if this were an ordinary story, it would end right there. But the story of the universe keeps, anybody know? Unfolding, stretch those arms out, unfolding. Oh, stretch so you can grow. And what once began in a blazing blossom of light continues every day. New stars sprout open in the deep soil of space. New plants and animals appear on the earth. Seeds of many kinds are scattered everywhere. And to help us remember, and new people are born every day with the spark of the first light still alive and burning deep inside, waiting like the everything seed to shine in the ways yet to be known. And so we're gonna go ahead and sing out and go to our class, okay? Okay. Our first reading is uh, by Starhawk and it's called Make Love Possible. The earth is a living conscious being 
in company with cultures of many different times and places, we name these things as sacred, air, fire, water, and earth. Whether we see them as the breath, energy, blood, and body of the mother, or as the blessed gifts of the creator, or as symbols of the interconnected systems that sustain life, we know that nothing can live without them. To call these things sacred is to say that they have a value beyond their usefulness for human ends, that they themselves become the standards standards by which our acts, our economics, our laws, and our purpose might be judged. To honor the sacred is to create conditions in which nourishment, sustenance, habitat, knowledge, freedom, and beauty can thrive. To honor the sacred is to make love possible. And our second reading today is called The Coming Dancers by Jacqueline Beauregard. Before I came, I was in the bird song, announcing dawn in globes of dew on needles of the spruce dropping onto fallow fields. I could hear gulls spread sound over the sea, colored blue by dawn light, and feel swelling water bounce off the ocean floor. There, in shafts of light, the bones of my ancestors began to drum an echo, and to that beat, stone pounded stone upon the shore. Out of the rock came life, animals, ground seeds. I inhaled life in the first breath that blew through a reed. My flesh moved with other hands drawing rhythm from a skin drum. Knowing hunger in the reach of an empty bowl, I wore my beads and danced on earth's soft face, gave life, helped children to their feet, learned from smooth stones to question my uneven edges. For a time, it is all mine until my bones form instruments for the coming dancers whose song, whose indecipherable words, my spirit will come to understand. So at Holly's daycare, there is this wall in the lobby when you walk in and it hangs all the pictures and names of the employees who work there. It's nice, you know, you see the smiling faces of the people who will be in both of my daughter's lives for years to come. It's also sweet uh, when Holly wants to name the faces and the names she recognizes. At the very least, it's a very nice way to enter and leave the building each day, seeing all of the people who love her and care for her. Well, all that sweetness. All those good feelings went right out the window the other month when a big red flag just showed up on this wall. To my dismay, you see, very every now and then the wall sort of takes on this get to know you activity with the teachers, you see, and they've done other things like arrange them by their favorite colors or listing their heroes during Women's History Month. Well, this particular activity, this rearrangement a couple months ago that stopped me in my tracks was in sorting the couple dozens of staff or so into four categories to denote their favorite season of the year. This was my inner monologue. I tried to write it down as I took that wall in on a Tuesday afternoon. Okay, cool, cool. This should be interesting. Spring, okay, good chunk of folks. Yes, new life, verdant, warmer weather. Yes, come through. What about summer? Oh, okay, well, less, but still a good handful of people or more who like that warmth, that beach season, possibly some vacation time. Okay, 
Okay. Well, what about what about fall? Oh, oh yes. Here we go. It's true beauty. The brown county colors. A nice crisp autumn morning. Yes, lovely. Truly lovely. Moving on. Well, okay. What about winter? Uh, winter. Uh, winter. Are you there, Winter? It's me, Nicholas. Earth to Winter. Winter, come in. No, for real. What about Winter? And as if a slap in the face of this former Wisconsinite who wore shorts during high school in winter, the bulletin board responded coldly and callously, what about Winter? I kid you not. Not a single staff person chose winter as their favorite season. Now, I grew up with winter as my favorite season. Winter in Wisconsin is amazing, adventurous, a great time, especially for children. But I will admit, I, in, my, in my adulthood, I have come to enjoy the last quarter of the year a little bit more than the first quarter, especially in the beauty of this part of the country. But come on, not one person loves winter most? It occurred to me then, sadly, Hattie and I needed to change Holly's daycare. <laughs> no, just kidding, we didn't do that, but rather a question did occur to me and about, about how the seasons of, that, of the year relate to our individual and our collective lives. Do we spend much of the year longing for what might be or dreading what is just around the corner? Do we check out during certain times of the year or reemerge full of life when the thermometer reaches a certain level? Are there, are there detriments or benefits depending on how we relate to the turning of the seasons in life? Well, after my shock and horror wore off, I was relieved to know two things. One, that winter was almost a year away, so there was still time to transform some hearts and minds on the beauty of winter. But also, two, that I was conveniently in the process of planning a six Sunday uh, series on the sources of Unitarian Universalism. And one of these uh, sources today, this source, would give me, would give us space to reflect on the wisdom and gifts presented to us from earth-centered traditions. These traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature and yes, that includes winter. Today we explore this final source and with it comes a completion of the sources that have shaped Unitarian universalism into the inclusive, living, breathing tradition it aspires to be today. The sixth source gives us language. The sixth source gives us language and entry into the sacredness that surrounds us all. It's different, it's different than the first source, which speaks to our direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder. It's sort of like that, but it's kind of like a Venn diagram then, like there's a lot of overlap between the two, but uh, between mystery and wonder in the natural world, but they are not completely interchangeable. The sixth source is also not the same as the fifth source, which we explored last week, even though there's a lot of scientific beauty found in our natural world. No, the sixth source is focused much like the third and fourth sources, pointing us towards specific spiritual teachings and traditions that have existed throughout human history and indeed are still emerging today. Both the spiritual teachings specifically and the earth-centered traditions generally are too numerous, too diverse to explore this morning in great detail. Uh, even as an overview, the intricacies and nuances among these traditions and wisdoms passed down generation to de generation from ind indigenous peoples in the Americas or uh, on the European and African continents or from other parts of the world are complex and too abundant to fit in a 15-minute sermon. This is due in large part 
I believe, because unlike Abrahamic traditions, generally speaking, generally speaking, the spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions have not been codified. There's not an easily available just set of creeds, a set of commandments, catechisms, or religious uh, education curriculum. There are no elevator speeches in the same way or bumper stickers that sort of sum it up the way we might be accustomed to with Western religion and Western religion's control on truth. However, that doesn't mean there is not a set of beliefs, wisdom, shared stories and values named in these various traditions, some that thread many traditions together, peoples together, and some that are distinct depending on the tradition or teaching or place in the world. There are countless rituals, ceremonies, and traditions that continue to shape the worldview of millions of people across the world, including many of you here. And indeed, the lack of homogeneity fosters, in my mind, an appreciation for the organic, natural development and unfolding of these ways of engaging with the world around us. Sometimes, Unitarian Universalists, especially those who are not of indigenous or pagan background, reduce these teachings to phrases like the sacred circle of life or the rhythms of life, as is the case in the phrasing of our sixth source. And while those phrases are important, they may elicit some feelings and motivations of how one might celebrate or live by those teachings. We are called by this sixth source, I believe, to dig deeper and enter into more intentional, relational, and meaningful understandings of the traditions that have been affirmed from time immemorial. Here are a few orientations that might open us to the deeper engagement with our sixth source. First, it all begins with the earth and the universe. Deities, spirits, gods surely exist in many or if not most of these traditions, but it is often the earth that takes center stage, earth-centered traditions recognize a tremendous value and an essential quality to this home that we all share. Ecofeminist writer and leader in the neo-pagan and goddess movements, Starhawk, draws a direct connection between how we understand the earth and how we treat the earth. In other words, they influence the other in a kind of a circle. Our value of the earth is how we treat the earth, how we treat the earth is reflective of how, our, how we value the earth and it reinforces and creates a cycle. In our first reading this morning, Starhawk writes, quote, the earth is a living conscious being in company with cultures of many different times and places. We name these things as sacred air, fire, water, and earth. These are the sacred elements that shape a worldview for many throughout the world, along with spirit, as Anita reminded me during a service during my first year, if you recall. Air, fire, water, earth, and spirit are sacred, according to Starhawk, and our actions follow from this understanding of the sacred or lack thereof. To honor the sacred, she writes, is to create conditions in which nourishment, sustenance, habitat, knowledge, freedom, and beauty can thrive. Sort of like Sycamore Land Trust. To honor the sacred is to make love possible. To honor the sacred is to make love possible. Moving from a worldview of the earth being for our use our abuse, our dominion, our domination, for our benefit, for our lives alone, towards one of sacred recognition and tender care of mutuality is easier said than done. And yet the teachings of earth-centered traditions, including neo-paganism, invite a remembering of what is all around us. There are signs, there are billboards, there are things to bring us back to a remembering of the presence of sacredness 
that surrounds us. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes that through ritual, through ceremonies, and being in nature, those things help us remember to remember. Before we can remember, we need to remember to remember who we are and where we are and how we long to live on this earth. Back to that four seasons thing for a second, which I still can't quite seem to let go of, winter. Ugh. But honestly, if you consider the seasons for many cultures and geographies are, are roughly a quarter, not all, all places, but roughly a quarter of each year, how we engage or not engage with these quarters, with them, with these seasons, results in an experience of either the, the fullness of life or in the disregard of a quarter here or a little bit more there. What a waste. Indeed, there are lessons to be taught in both the cyclical nature of the rhythms of life and the distinction between those rhythms. There are lessons in the fall that cannot be grasped in the spring. There are teachings in winter that the summer cannot even imagine. And thus our attention to the message or messages being brought to us as the world turns is changing. It is changing, that life is changing, that life is fragile, that life must be tended to with care and concern. The Four Seasons are not just a hotel brand and a landscaping firm. The Four Seasons align with our four directions. They surround us as we can consider the interior lives that we live and the exterior movements of our lives. Indeed, the Four Seasons give us expectation that not only is the world continuing to change around us, but our lives will and are changing as well. One might consider the four seasons of our human life journey, the quarters of life that each have, their own challenges and beauty with, the power our quarter lives have in honoring who we are as sacred babies and children, as young adults and becoming settled in the world being settled and considering our continued purpose or perhaps our emerging purpose in that stage of life. And finally, becoming elders with wisdom to share with future generations. All of this is not to be taken for granted. From ecological care and the, uh, to the concern of our fellow human being, from knowing where we come from and where we are headed from understanding who we are and whose we are from being of community and for community, the wisdoms of earth centered traditions can give us language, vision and courage to be what we must be now and always. Jacqueline Beauregard offers a life journey in words that spark the natural imagination, a reminder of our interdependence and our interexistence with all of life. I'd like to share it again. She reflects on her life writing, before I came, I was in the bird song, song announcing dawn in globes of dew on needles of the spruce dropping onto fallow fields. I could hear gulls spread sound over the sea, colored blue by dawn light and feeling and feel swelling water bounce off the ocean floor. There in the shafts of light, the bones of my ancestors began to drum and echo. And to that beat stone pounded stone upon the shore. Out of the rock came life, animals ground seeds. I inhaled life in the first breath that blew through a reed. My flesh moved with others, hands drawing rhythm from a skin drum, knowing hunger in the reach of an empty bowl. I wore my beads and danced on earth's soft skin, gave life, helped children to their feet, learned from smooth stones to question my uneven edges. For a time, it is all mine until my bones form instruments for the coming dancers whose song, whose indecipherable words 
my spirit will come to understand. In the fall of our lives and even in the winter, what more can we dream of than to transform our hearts and longings toward instruments that can be used by the coming dancers? Each of us, each of us, once dancer, still dancer, and always a dancer yet capable of deeper living, deeper living, fuller loving, and singing a song with words that must be heard, indecipherable as they may be, by us and by all. May we sing, may we dance, may we deeply ground ourselves in the four seasons of our years so that in our lives we may remember to remember and in our remembering we may become one with all. May it be so, and amen.